Um, so welcome guys. We are here at the University of, um, sorry, at Birmingham Dental School uh, with a special guest. Uh, we've got Dr. Satnam Singh Verdi, who is a restorative um, registrar, um, I believe. And um, he's on his path to becoming a specialist. Um, I don't want to give it all away right now, um, but I just want to say thank you for doing this with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes. So if we just start with um, what your current role is um, here at the dental school in Birmingham, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, 2017 started as a clinical lecturer um, with a uh, honorary specialty registrar uh, aspect to the um, uh, pathway. In addition to that, um, initiated my PhD, or started my PhD, sorry, in 2018. Um, and uh, as the years have gone on, I've been fortunate enough to be the lead of the um, simulated operative skills programs at the University of Birmingham yes. uh, for the undergraduate teaching as well. In addition to that, um, I'm also a uh, serve as the honorary assistant secretary um, to the British Endodontic Society, yes. um, and I work in uh, uh, part time in a specialist endodontic practice as well. Yes. Yeah, so. From what you can hear there, he's a busy man <laughs> and he's a very experienced man as well. So, you know, just talking to him, I've just been gleaning a lot and I um, want to be able to share that with you guys who are thinking of dentistry as a career and even going through the specialist um, pathway. So it'd just be good to start off with um, what led you into dentistry as a career? Yeah, so I think, um, as cliche as it sounds, um, I really enjoyed the sciences, um, particularly biology, um, and I really, in, again, this is very cliche, and I hear this from so many prospective students, but I really like the artistic aspect of dentistry. Mm. I think it really allowed me to express myself, um, and uh, it was a really satisfying way of doing that. Yes. Um, and I felt with dentistry, it was it was, you were able to do that a little bit more than maybe some of the other healthcare professional careers, yeah. Your family, relatives, any of them in dentistry? So, no, um, I was first generation born here and um, yeah, my uh, mum and dad were labourers, sisters and uh, have gone into kind of other aspects uh, uh, like IT, uh, and uh, um, one's a pharmacist, um, uh, but that's, and then my other sister's gone into kind of an artistic field as well. Yes. So yeah, I was the first in my family to, to do dentistry. Yeah. Whereabouts did you do your schooling, primary school, secondary school? Yeah, so state schools all the way through, um, and uh, just local in the area of Birmingham. Uh, mm. So um, I was very, very fortunate enough to get onto the um, undergraduate dental program at, the, at Birmingham um, uh, through the access to Birmingham scheme at the time. Okay, yeah. so just a little bit about that. What, what was the access scheme? So I think it, it, certain individuals who um, can apply would be those who are from the first generation um, uh, individuals who are applying mm. um, where I think their schools or their colleges that they may have gone to um, fall below a certain average, national average, mm. uh, and there are other criteria that I'm not too familiar with at the moment yeah. um, that may have changed over the years, yeah. um, but uh, those in, it's worth looking into yes. um, if you come from a similar background, yeah. um, because what that does, and it lowers your entry requirement grades. Yeah, and it's amazing to think that now here you are on the <laughs> pathway to, 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 to specialism, and that was your route into yeah, dentistry. definitely, definitely. So yeah. I'm very grateful to the university for that. Yeah. And um, hopefully they see that they've invested right, correctly as well, because they yeah. also invest in those individuals that, that they teach as well. Were there any other dental schools that you applied to at the time? What was that experience like? Yeah, so I, I applied to, I think, a few of the London ones. Uh, one was Leeds as well, because I think they did a similar access scheme. But Birmingham was the only one that gave me an offer. Yes, yeah. so everyone missed out. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what was that experience of um, now starting dental school? You know, w was it a big change for you? What was that like? Yeah, so I think, I think it was. Um, 
uh, I think it was you're, you're surrounded by extremely highly motivated and highly intelligent individuals mm -hmm. um, uh, and so um, it was a very is a big culture shock effectively um, not sa not saying that um, anyone in the schools weren't uh, that I attended weren't of that similar um, uh, nature but the caliber was just very different mm -hmm. um, so I did have a, a period of acclimatization but Again, I think you get used to it very quickly in terms mm. of because you're, you're you're dealing with so many challenges from the academic side of things. You've got exams and you're you're getting on with things quite uh, quite quickly and quite soon on into the course. Yeah, what would you say you enjoyed about the process of dental school? I know it's it's some time yeah. ago now, but what, what were some highlights? Yeah, I mean, some of my lifelong friends I've met um, in dental school. That was, uh, you know, uh, I still keep in contact with some of them now. Um, the I think the learning of the clinical aspects was for me uh, the highlight, which is why I've kind of um, uh, uh, wanting to specialise in that spe specific aspect where there's a lot of clinical opportunity. Mm. I really enjoyed that aspect. Yeah. yeah. Did you find that um, you were one of a few with the same background, or? Did you find a lot of other students who had a similar background to yourself? So I think um, when I was applying, there was still, I think there was quite a few individuals with a similar background mm. um, applying. Um, I'm not too sure how the statistics are those at, at the moment, but I remember there was a, there was a fair few that mm. had a similar background. The vast majority were from kind of um, self-funded schools and things like that as well, mm. um, or grammar schools though. Um, but there was still enough to have a, when, when I was studying yeah. um, uh, to still feel part of a community. Yeah. yeah. Was um, dental school a breeze for you? No, or? absolutely not. Definitely or, or, not no. Any challenges you can remember? <laughs> um, again, I think the um, particularly when I was doing it, it was it was just exam after exam after exam. I think mm -hmm. that was really challenging. But I think the curriculum has now slightly changed to reduce the number of exams but then make them more kind of applicable to kind of doing your hands-on dentistry so yeah. I think the course is changing for the better in that front yes. um, there was that um, and I think just balancing that with with um, general kind of lifestyle was, was difficult as well yeah. um, I think they're, they're, those skills you learn the more you, those are skills that you learn the more inundated you get, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so that was a challenge, yeah. Once you'd qualified, um, what was the process like? Had, you know, was, was it VT um, yeah. before it became Dental Foundation training? What, what, what were your next steps after? So I was, I was, I think, the second cohort at the time where the Dental Foundation training was a um, national recruitment process. Um, I, I really didn't do well in that mm. process. Um, uh, I, I, I was actually one of the four students who, uh, in the year, that didn't get a place wow. at the time. Um, so, it, and, and we, at that time, we found out in December. Mm. So we had to go through the whole year knowing you weren't, you weren't, you didn't get a place. Mm. Um, and I was very lucky in the sense that a place, place became available. There was more by the time that year had ended yes. and the number of students in the in the country that had passed or failed yes. it meant that the numbers added up so i managed to get a place yes. um, but it was it was a very tough process yeah um, and something that um i i was maybe a, a catalyst to maybe me wanting to pay more attention and apply myself to the field yeah so when dental students fail exams or have to retake a year um, or maybe don't get a place for foundation mm. training, it can feel like it's the end of the world. It really did. Um, yeah. What got you through knowing that I've yeah. been through this year, but there's, yeah. no, there's no place for me? Yeah, I think I had a good support network of friends um, that really helped uh, me get through that period. Um, my tutors were really supportive. Mm. Um, I think they they were trying to make sure that I at least had something to come to um, after that universe, after that period of study ended. Mm. So maybe some observations or kind of uh, shadowing in a secondary care setting. Mm. So they were really supportive of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, there was always word on the grapevine that um, uh, there were some more places that were going to be opening. Yes. 
Now, however, it's a lot more difficult to not get a place because I think the um, at the time, I think individuals who studied in Europe would also rank higher than those individuals that had um, uh, um, uh, the priority was given to equally to mm. those. But now I think th those from UK trained institutes are given the first priority. So what I'm getting from your story is um, in terms of your entry to dental school, it wasn't straightforward. You didn't get all offers from all the dental schools you applied to. Um, dental school, you had the challenges as well of not getting um, your place for foundation training and waiting until you know a year later to find out, okay, a place yeah. to open up. So it doesn't look like it was a smooth ride and you've still managed to get to this position. Um, sometimes we can think someone in your position you must have had no problems, no barriers. It's just smooth sailing. Yeah, I can see how people can arrive to that assumption. But I think behind every successful individual, there's there's failures. And I think the, the part of improving and getting to a, a certain standard is about facing kind of challenges and setbacks. And it's about how you how you manage those yeah. um, effectively. So, yeah, um, I'm, I'm fortunate in that. Um, you know, for the University of Birmingham who gave me that chance in the mm. first place, yeah. um, both in my uh, undergraduate and also uh, yeah. specialty training as well. Yeah. So tell us about foundation training, um, your year foundation training. I mean, you said it was the second intake for foundation dentists. So oh. um, it was, it was still, I was still aligned on the path because mm. enough spaces had opened at the time. Yes. Um, and so I was still alongside my colleagues okay but I had to go through that year not knowing that I had a place or not yes. um, but as I mentioned it was still along that same I was still in my year group when I went into my foundation training one of the best experiences of my life honestly it was um, so I got it was in Chester um, mm. it was with a very very enthusiastic uh, uh, foundation dental trainer um, his name's Atik Atif Iqbal, hmm. um, and uh, he was absolutely amazing. And you know, um, we were still in a, we were in a high needs area, but um, he really was enthusiastic about my career development. Really allowed me to, um, you know, stretch my wings. Encouraged me hmm. uh, all the way to apply for these various things. Gave me the space to do that as well. Um, and so again, very grateful to him, uh, and um, that that place um, where, where, I, where I carried out my foundation dental practice. Yeah. Let us know, what, what would you say you took, maybe one thing, one main thing you took from dental school, and then one main thing you took from your foundation year as a clinician today? Yeah, so I think the, the dental school, um, it, I think it really equips you with a lot of clinical knowledge. Mm. So I'm very grateful for the um, the curriculum that's in place mm. and, 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 and continues to develop. Um, I, I feel um, uh, I was very well equipped to manage challenges on mm. a clinical level when I went on into my um, uh, foundation training. I think from foundation training, what I learned was, um, was a different culture of dentistry in a way because you know you, 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 when you when you're in a specific institute in a specific area they practice dentistry and there's certain themes that run through um, uh, uh, along the way but actually I was in Chester which where the main dental schools were Liverpool and Manchester um, and you know I was amongst a complete different crowd mm. uh, and they had different kind of ideas and different um, uh, um, uh, kind of ways of thinking about certain challenges uh, and it was really interesting to see that mm. and what I learned from that was to kind of for those short periods of time where you're in your career development post such as your dental core training would be to go to different institutes that you studied from mm. uh, and um, although there are kind of logistical challenges and personal circumstances may dictate otherwise yes. but I think it's always valuable to do that. One thing that does I remember in dental school, um, students would be frustrated that when I'm talking to this clinician, this is the approach that they would take. But another cl clinician has a little bit of a different take on the same patient, the same situation. And that's just a normal thing in dentistry. Indeed. Um, how did you reconcile all of that when you were getting all these 
different approaches to, to doing dentistry? Yeah. So I think it's that's a really good question and, and, it's, and it's something that still is uh, applicable now uh, in kind of specialty training uh, where um, you are hearing different advice from different consultants. But I think it's, it's about being critical to what you hear um, and also um, uh, uh, yourself going to look at the literature and seeing what is out there mm. to determine um, uh, what an appropriate way is. And I think it's really important to appreciate that there isn't one set way mm. to doing things right. There's multiple different ways to doing things right. Um, but it's the justification as to why um, uh, it's been done that way in particular uh, for that individual. And mm. it needs to be based on a case by case basis. Yeah, no, fantastic. Definitely something I can take on board even now when yeah. I talk to different mentors. So you've done your foundation um, training um, in Chester. What was the next step? Uh, for so you? next step was dental core training. Um, so I, I, at that time, I wanted to um, decide on. I, I, I'd, by the end of that year, I'd wanted to um, do some further training, effectively, and it was either going to be to, through an informal, uh, well, sorry, a formal self-funded route, such as an M Clindent program, mm -hmm. um, or, or I wanted to explore the um, uh, um, funded route, which is where you do your dental core training and you get onto a NHS recognised training program or an integrated academic training program, mm. and so I went to I went I was successful in the round of interviews for my dental core training, um, and I um, and I managed to get a restorative dental core training post at Leeds Leeds mm. Dental Institute, so going from Chester to then Leeds for a year, and mm. again, I at that point I really fell in love with restorative dentistry. Yeah. It was something that I definitely knew I wanted to do. So, at what point did you think, actually? the specialist pathway could be for me? Was that in dental school? Was that junior foundation year? When did that start becoming? So I think um, in my, it was in my foundation year that I, I kind of wanted to explore that and I wanted to put myself out there to try mm. and, and achieve that. And, and um, I think the, the moment it was when I, um, it was actually through the British Endodontic Society, uh, it really inspired me to, to want to proceed to further training. Um, so I'd applied for a, uh, one of their prizes. Hmm. Um, it's the Hearty Prize, it's still available now. It's one of the uh, uh, undergraduate prizes um, uh, at that, uh, yeah, it's one of the undergraduate prizes where you write an essay on a specific topic that they set. Uh, and um, it gets marked, and you, you, uh, uh, I was joint winner for that for that year with another very talented individual, and that really was the catalyst, I think, mm. that um, allowed me to then, or made me think that that it's possible, mm. it's possible to do, um, uh, and and I then just kept on applying to different things, and putting my efforts into those submissions, yes. um, and being aware of the various interviews uh, that were coming around the corner for dental core training, preparing myself for that. Um, and then I think when I got the dental core training interview and I got the pay place mm. uh, and I was successful in, in attaining a post in restorative dentistry which for the dental core training year one, which there are not many around, they're, 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 they are few and far between. I think at that point I, I, I felt a little bit more confident in trying to pursue a, that, that career. Yeah. So. You've been Birmingham for dental school, then Chester for the foundation year, now Leeds. Yeah. This is quite a bit of movement. Yeah. Um, how did family fit into all of this? Yeah, so I was really, really lucky uh, in that I've had a very supportive family. Um, they were aware of my intentions of wanting to, to kind of explore this path and that would require me moving. Um, around the country a little bit. At the time, I was I didn't have any commitments in terms of children or, or, or wife, or uh, and my mom, mother and father were really supportive. So mm. it was easier then. Um, that became a lot more difficult as I went down the dental core training years. Mm -hmm. um, I got married in my third year of dental core training, but Birmingham was home for me as well, and mm. my my partner was from Birmingham, um, so. Studying in Birmingham for my specialty training has been an absolute, uh, uh, it's, it's been a big factor in, in choosing where to go. 
And this is something I hear as well, the fact that because there are so few posts for dental core training, you don't really have the luxury of choice on location. No, you, you have some very, very talented individuals that can really do well at interviews and um, get many, many posts. I, I didn't consider myself that. Um, and so I was very, again, very fortunate to have gotten a, had been um, uh, successful in the place at Birmingham. At this stage, I just want to, for those that are thinking of specialising, um, is there only one route to doing it? Uh, are there multiple routes? Can you just enlighten Yeah, us? so I think there's a, that's a real, um, it's a real topic in itself. There's multiple different routes that you can do this in. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a nice um, kind of flow diagram actually on the early, as part of the early careers group mm. on the British Endodontic Society that outlines some of those pathways just to signpost individuals. But generally speaking, you have um, uh, formal routes and then you have informal routes. Your mm. formal routes can consist of funded posts, so those that where you apply through competitive entry onto various programs, um, although you have your self-funded routes, mm. such as your MClindent programs, um, and those are mainly for the monospecialties. Um, for things like uh, restorative dentistry, the, I think there are only real kind of funded formal pro training programs, and those can then be further split into um, how those funding how those are funded. Mm. If you've got an NHS kind of funded program, you can do your, it's, it's kind of a typical three-year specialist training post or a five-year mm. restorative dentistry uh, post. Um, uh, and and your, you have certain splits of time in the mm. week between those, between the different activities. You then have an academic um, uh, training post, which is funded by the NIHR, which is so still part of the NHS body. Mm. Um, and that's generally a three-year training program um, where you are working up an application for um, a, uh, a fellowship program mm. or funding for a PhD. If you're successful, you then complete your PhD full-time in three years. Um, uh, you then, once you've completed that, you then come back into your specialty training or you proceed on to kind of a run-through training program if you're part of kind of um, some other um, uh, specialties. Yes. Um, so it's a total of eight years. And then you have an integrated academic training program which is university funded. Mm. Um, and that's uh, such as myself where you're a clinical lecturer or an academic clinical lecturer where you have your PhD already. Yes. And as part of that, you um, uh, it's required that you do a PhD, um, you do your specialty training in either the mono specialties or the full restorative specialty, um, or you can do the restorative specialty with um, and um, a mono specialty such as what I'm doing. Yes. Yeah. So there's a self-funded route, or there's the funded route where you'd be going through dental core training and then working your way yeah, um, forward. Yeah, that's right. So, you, is, is there a rough figure about how much it usually costs to take the self-funded route or is it, is it very varied? It's very varied depending on each institute but it is a significant amount mm. um, particularly if you included uh, I mean it is a significant amount but it is a very very intense program that that is mapped to the specialist curriculum mm. um, uh, um, that has been set by the GDC yeah. so they, they are they are very intense robust programs yeah. um, but they are very expensive um, so I would look into that on their individual websites yeah. on how much that is. What I'll do, I'll probably get the link um, that you've got that yeah. maps out yeah, yeah, just yeah. for people that, that want to yeah. see, I'll put in the description. Yeah. That's available. specific to endodontics of course yeah. uh, and, and, and most of what I've been saying is very specific to um, restorative dentistry. Yes. Um, maybe there's other kind of specialties like paediatrics or orthodontics that have it slightly different. Um, but yeah. how, how so sometimes I talk with foreign trained dentists who may be already specialists in their country yeah. or they want to come um, to the UK and then um, train yeah. to become specialists. Are there any differences between the route, let's say the route you're taking to the route that somebody who's foreign trained? Yes, so I think um, uh, that's a really good question. I think um, there is a route for mediated entry although there are a lot of um, uh, changes that are happening in that space at the moment that uh, the GDC are 
um, developing. Uh, a, 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 there's there's more change. I suppose it's a more fluid environment, mediated entry. It's not as formal by its very nature. I think if you can demonstrate equivalence to specialty training in the United Kingdom, mm. um, then you put together a portfolio to demonstrate that, um, and then you submit that to the GDC, and they then assess that mm. um, to see if it meets their criteria, and then mm. you can be put onto that specialist list. It is a very tough process to do that. Mm. Um, you have to demonstrate uh, uh, you know, that you've kind of undertaken a similar level of clinical hours mm. for your academic, clinical and your research kind of uh, split in accordance with their specialty mm. training program and you have to formally demonstrate that and you have to get a lot of things validated, mm. put some cases together uh, as well so and then submit that mm. uh, to the GDC. Out of interest, do you know anybody personally who's done it that done. way? Yeah, so um, for my, so although I've got my specialty training for restorative uh, in the works, usually prior to this, we could do the specialty training for restorative dentistry and also um, uh, get onto the specialist list for restorative dentistry plus one of the monospecialties. Um, previously, way back when, um, you could get onto restorative dentistry plus three other specialties, mm. such as your perio, endo, and pros. So periodontics, prosthodontics, and endodontics, you'd get onto those specialists as well just by completing that specialty training program. Mm. But now um, you could only get onto um, the specialist list for restorative dentistry. And if you wanted to do a monospecialty, you have to apply through a mediated entry route. So I myself have put together a portfolio, mm. um, having completed my specialty examination mm. for um, endodontics yeah. to, to submit. So I myself have demonstrated how I've been able to map my map the curriculum, um, sorry, map my activities to that curriculum, and I'm awaiting their response, I suppose. So there's the two pathways, either you go the DCT route, which is funded, um, or you self-fund. If you're foreign trained, there's this mediated Entry, route. Yeah. Is there any other way? I think at the moment, that's those are the only ways, really. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think... Um, Would you be able to... Let's say you're a specialist in another country. That, I, that I'm aware of, sorry. Yeah. And then you come to the UK. Are you able to maybe go through the DCT route and go through that yeah, route? As... Yeah, definitely. So in order to apply to specialty training, mm. um, your dental core training years are mandatory. Mm. Um, and so um, you, if you wanted to then come through uh, from a different country uh, and you've kind of... Um, you're on now a level playing field with every other dentist, so you've completed your RE examinations, etc. Mm -hmm. um, then um, that would be the route that I would proceed on if you wanted to go down a formal training route. Okay, so if a foreign trained dentist, if you're a specialist already, is trying to see if you can go through this mediated pathway, yeah. or you're going to have to go through um, the same route that yeah. UK trained yeah. um, dentists would go through. And, and as I said, I think if you're able to demonstrate that, that mm. you are, um, uh, you meet the criteria and mm. you, you can map your activities mm. to a, um, uh, to the curriculum that's in place here, mm. um, it may be a very, that would be the first approach I would potentially take. Yeah. If you can't, then you have to then try and meet those activities and meet those same criteria yes. and that's either as I said that will be through a formal training route yeah so one of the things um, I, I, I say is you know when I face a very challenging case in clinic I've got to get out of jail free card which is send it to somebody much more experienced um, send it to a, to a specialist or you know, someone like yourself who's trained to be a specialist for yourself um, how do you deal with extremely challenging cases where you're very experienced, but it's just such a challenging case that you know yeah. y y y you need to? Yeah. So I think I think a lot of the challenging cases. Um, I mean, as a as a registrar at the moment, 
um, you you still have a get out of jail free card because you can speak to the <laughs> consultant about it. But I suppose when you're at that level, it's mm. it's very similar in that there will always be someone more experienced than you mm. who has managed those cases, um, and um, it's about seeking their advice mm. uh, before you proceed to do anything in that yes. instance, um, and uh, arriving at a consensus of mm. what needs to be done. And as I said, it's something bringing it back to something similar to what we mentioned at the start of. Our conversation in that it, everything needs to be managed on a case by case basis, mm. uh, and having several opinions um, uh, is always a is always a uh, on, on challenging cases such as those mm. are, is always a good um, factor. So yeah. you know, and it may not even just be opinions from individuals in that specialty. There may be aspects to that case that you're managing mm. that um, may require skills from another specialty. Yes. So you're managing things in a multidisciplinary way. Give us an overview, sort of a bird's eye view of um, the landscape of dentistry. So there are general dentists, um, you've got therapists, hygienists, dental technicians, you've got specialists, you've got uh, registrars like yourself who are progressing to become specialists. What, what, what's, what's, how is it all supposed to work harmoniously in, in the yeah, UK? Yeah, so, so I, I mean in an ideal, in ideal world, most of the diseases can be managed in, in primary care. Um, there are individuals with enhanced skills that can also go out into primary care, such as specialists who do these kind of endocrine dent programs, etc., um, to that can manage complicated monospecialty level um, care. You've mm. got some practices actually that have multiple different consultants, even mm. uh, and specialists in, in sorry, multiple different specialists in that under the one roof, mm. and they can provide some pretty um, comprehensive care to patients. I think with secondary care, it's it's really, particularly for restorative dentistry anyway, from, from my understanding, is that it's really designed for patients that cannot get that care in a primary care setting. Mm. So it's patients who have complicated multidisciplinary needs, mm. such as you know, cleft palate, oncology patients, um, hyperdontia, mm. um, uh, m you know, major maxillofacial trauma. Mm. That's where I suppose the hospital setting is really designed to, to focus in on. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of the cases with enhanced skills, if it can be managed in primary care, mm. it works better for patients and um, uh, uh, those who are, I suppose, in, yeah. in these institutes as well. Yeah, no, that's really good. We left off with them um, dental core training in Leeds. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did that then progress? So then at that time, I think, uh, well, at that time, I then was aware that I needed to progress to do another uh, dental core training, another two dental core training years. Um, and that was um, because at that time, the requirement to go into restorative specialist training was you have at least four years mm. pro after um, your undergraduate training. That was a minimum requirement. So that would include a dental foundation training year mm. and then also three dental core training years. Mm. Um, so I decided to do it in a different specialty. Um, in oral maxillofacial surgery at mm. a tertiary referral centre just across the road, which is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, um, where I worked under several amazing maxillofacial consultants. Mm. Um, and uh, it was a very, very tough year. Um, what made it tough? Just the working week. It was a almost a 95-hour working week. Wow. Um, uh, we had on calls. It was something that was completely different. You know, you're going into the sphere of medicine. There, it was. I was completely alien into yeah. that to that aspect. Give us of a it. taster of some of the things you were handling. Well, I, I would say I wasn't handling anything too extensive, but yeah. you were around a lot of patients who have had kind of. Uh, uh, you know, significant maxillofacial surgery. Mm. So, um, you know, maxillectomies, mandibulectomies, um, osteotomies, uh, you're dealing with major kind of surgery cases. Mm. Um, you know, I remember one patient that came, comes to mind quite a significant amount is um, a patient who had a tumour on their, their right eye. Effectively, half of his, half of his um, face was, was um, ex well, I wouldn't say extracted, that's not the right word, but resected away. Mm. Um, and then they put kind of a thigh flap, effectively, uh, onto, the, onto the face to, to granulate in the area. Um, so, you know, that was really extensive. It was a tertiary referral centre, so they were managing cases that were extremely, extremely difficult anyway. And the team was so amazing in their skill and ability. 
But I just mm. realised in that year that that wasn't the stuff that excited me. What really excited me was kind of the fine attention to detail mm. that I think the restorative specialty um, uh, 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 offers. Yeah. It really, um, uh, that was a year of clarity yes. in that sense. So you're on the strict training pathway. Your colleagues, your peers, that are in general practice, uh, maybe you have a lot more flexibility. Yeah. Um, and they're not working nine to five hours no. um, <laughs> a, a week. Do you feel um, a type of way about that? Do you feel like you're missing out? Like what yeah. was what was I, I think, life um, like for you? I think that because it was a year, mm. because it was one year, it, you could see that it was for a limited period of time. Um, although it was very very hard. Mm. Um, the other thing as well is is you climatize to it as well. And I think it allowed you, and I think one of the things I got from that year was it really allowed me to work a little bit more than what I would normally would have mm. because you were just pushed to that limit. Mm. Um, and they, the consultants and the registrars and the other DCTs there were just working to such a high level and you were surrounded by individuals who were very career minded. Mm. Um, and so I think it just focused you in a little bit more on that as well. And then you finished DCT two. Yeah. Was your DCT3 a straight? Um, so th this was the year that I knew that I had to be, or I wanted to be in the specialty that I was going to specialise, wanted to specialise in, um, and then also be in a unit that I wanted to consider being in as well. And I'd heard many great things about Cardiff. Mm. Um, and uh, Cardiff was um, an amazing experience. I'd applied to the various different specialties and I was very lucky in that I was, I had a choice between different units and, in that year. Mm. Um, but I picked Cardiff because as I said, I had I heard many great things about it. Mm. What um, was the choice between? So I had, um, uh, Newcastle was a choice, um, mm. Leeds again was a choice mm. and Cardiff was a choice in that year. Okay. Um, so I was, very lucky in, yeah. in that year. I find it interesting that for dental school it was just Birmingham. Yeah. Now it's Cardiff. Yeah, Leeds, I, I was, you got yeah, I was very, very... Newcastle. I think at that time I had um, familiarised myself with the dental core training recruitment process and again, it was it was just through sheer practice, I suppose, and and with my colleagues as well, they were all successful, mm -hmm. um, and we practiced together, uh, uh, and uh, I think it was through that that I was able to um, improve my ability to perform at the interviews. Yeah, do you just find that I don't know? Is it just in your character that you like challenges? Indeed, definitely. Yeah. I think that's definitely <laughs> something I've realised about myself, and I think uh, it's not always worked to my. Uh, my favour, um, particularly when when it comes to kind of you know you've got family commitments as well. Mm. Um, uh, but it's something I've definitely realised uh, that I suppose the thrill of the challenge is something that is a little bit addictive as well. So we've got to a point where we've done um, your dental core training years, and now you're thinking about transitioning into the specialist um, pathways. Just tell us about how that went. Sure. So I think when you when I was at DCT three, I was pretty headstrong in wanting to go down a specialist pathway in restorative dentistry. Um, and uh, again, it, I was spent that year learning the different ways in which you could do that. So you know, it was it, for me, it was an option of going down an academic route or an NHS route. Mm. And I think having looked at my CV at the time, there was a lot of academic activities, and it just it very much a decent application for an academic post as well. Mm. I think, in, I think looking back now, I would have always wanted to do a PhD, whether I went down an NHS route or a, um, uh, whether I did it before or, or after my clinical training. Uh, and so I, I think for those reasons, I wanted to do the academic, uh, went down the academic route. Mm -hmm. Um, I was also surrounded by some really great individuals at the time who were academically trained mm -hmm. um, and they inspired me as well to, to want to proceed down that route as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so in order to do that, I had to um, uh, undergo the national recruitment process where I benchmarked. Mm. Um, so that means that you're, you, have, you are adequate enough to be trainable mm. uh, or get onto a restorative training program. Um, and then I had to sit a local interview at Birmingham here yes. where, where there was a position available. What was the interview like? 
it was definitely, it was very, very, very tough. Because, you know, I, I had wanted to do this for quite a long time at this point. Um, so it was very nerve-wracking. Nerve you know, with these interviews, there's always a, there was an element of making sure you're slightly relaxed so you can be very fluid. I may have over-prepared, so I was maybe slightly a bit rigid at the time, but that was just down to the fact that I was, I, I really wanted to get onto this training program. Yeah. And I was very lucky that I was, um, uh, I was successful in the interview. You've had your fair share of interviews from all the way when you applied to get into dental school to, to now. What would you say helped you with interviews and how did you see yourself growing with each yeah. round of interviews that you had to take? One of the things I would say is that once you're at the interview stage, my understanding is everyone's on a level playing field. Then it's about how you can transfer and communicate what you have on your CV and apply them to, to the answers and the questions that you are, that you are presented with. Mm. Um, so making sure that you answer the question, of course, that's, that goes without saying, but then also being able to kind of uh, demonstrate your ability to um, your abilities via some of the activities that you've done um, as part of your CV. There's, as I said, there's, there's, there's a, you know, you don't want to under-prepare because mm. you'll you, you be caught out, I suppose. You, but at the same time, you don't want to over-prepare so you're rigid as well. There's that sweet kind of spot in the middle where it's, you're, you know, you, you're prepared enough to mm. be able to answer the questions in a fluid way yeah. so that you can um, answer questions that you may have not prepared for as well. Yeah, I find that a lot of um, students, especially when they're at the teenage years, because they haven't had much in terms of interview experience, they can find it difficult yeah. to articulate what they know That's to it. somebody else. Indeed. Um, are there any pointers that you would give just for becoming more confident at articulating what you already know? Yeah, so I think um, one of the things that really helped, and I think I may have touched upon this a bit, a bit earlier, was um, practicing with others who are in a similar process, who have just gone above you, or who are just maybe past that, that benchmark or that, mm. that stage in their career, um, and, and practicing interviews and questions with them. Mm. Uh, it ultimately really helps you perform better on the day, mm. um, uh, because you know, they can help uh, see things and pick out faults. Uh, or areas of improvement mm. uh, uh, that would can make the difference on the day of the interview. 